So, um, how far, how fast, how often? Well, I thought I'd start with a, 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 a phrase. Train hard, race easy. Now, I don't like that phrase, because um, I think it could, it's a little bit misleading in some respects. Um, the second part of it, the race easy, I don't think, I think everyone's had that dream race where it's a little bit easier than expected and bits of it went well. But really, racing, I think, is the hardest thing we do. There's so much that can go wrong. Um, there's so, you know, there, there's so much you've got to think about. It, it's, it's not easy, whatever you do beforehand. Um, there's, a, uh, there's, a paper, there's a book out now called Do Hard Things. And uh, really, the essence of the book is things are hard. Embrace that they're hard and learn how to deal with the fact that they're hard. Um, there's, uh, I'm going to go into a bit of history later on, but uh, well, going back 60 years, um, Herb Elliott was a hot favourite for the Rome Olympic title. He was the world record holder, he trained well, and uh, he's going to the line of the final, and his coach, a guy called Percy Serity, um, that morning, Percy was 60, I believe, when he did this, he hammered out a time trial over a mile, and uh, his... Uh, uh, he went back and he reported to her, uh, reported, and he said, right, you know, you may run faster than me, but you're not going to run harder than me. Now, his message wasn't race easy. Okay, so that's that bit out of it. Train hard. That's what we're really dealing with today. Okay, because I think a lot of us train hard, but do we get the balance right? You know, do we train too hard? Do we train too easy? So that's what I'm just hoping to discuss around. We can often pick little bits out of magazine articles and such like that, and they'll almost tell you like one part of the story. I think what we're hoping to do here is to sort of balance things up, look at a couple of sides to a story, and uh, so as maybe you can sort of equip yourself uh, with firstly why you're doing certain sessions, and when you're doing them, think, oh yeah, I get this, the aim of this session is to do that. So, uh, so although the session might be laid out for you or you may have a plan, you go into that, that whatever your, your session is for that day with a little bit of an, more of an idea, maybe, as to what you're looking for. So, um, how fast, how far, how fast, how often, okay, training intensity distribution, it's cool. We'll go through, we'll discuss a model of training intensities. It might be different than the models you've seen before. We'll look at how these are commonly distributed in certain training programs and then we'll finish off, we'll discuss a few of the implications. Now, um, one measure of intensity is uh, if uh, um, there's such a thing called a, like a step lactate test. You may have seen a graph like this before, whereas uh, off mostly, normally done on a treadmill actually, well, uh, you'll run for two minutes at a pace, a lactate measurement is made, it'll go up to the next iteration of pace, and then uh, lactate measurement is made and that's sort of uh, what the x-axis is here and the lactate measurement is really a measure of intensity heartbeat my heart rate might be a measure of intensity but your blood lactate is a measure of intensity the reason it's a measure of intensity is um, we're always drawing from in, in endurance terms we're drawing from normally two energy systems, the aerobic energy system and the lactate energy system. And as we train with a bit more intensity, we, we draw more from the lactate energy system. Lactate itself is dealt with as the enemy. Actually, it's part of the reason you can run more intensely, actually. But there are byproducts that cause uh, fatigue and tiredness. But uh, in our scenario, a measure of blood lactate, if we can measure it, is a measure of intensity. Now, if uh, you get, this is a model of, I don't know who this one is supposed to be, because this last bit is probably a little bit uh, too shallow, but if we get a reasonably good runner maybe, um, they've got a, a lactate measurement, I, I think the unit is something like millimoles per litre or something like that, but uh, they've got a lactate measurement at rest, typically of two. Um, if they start walking, it will stay around that, bobble around a little bit, and then they might get to 10 kilometers an hour. Okay, that's, uh, what's, what's that, what's that? So nine, uh, uh, six, about six minutes per K, isn't it? And uh, you'll hit something, 
sometimes called lactate threshold one, sometimes called aerobic threshold. Now from aerobic threshold, as you speed up from then, your lactate reading in your blood will start going up. Uh, in a fairly linear way, initially. And uh, that, uh, um, for our runner here, occurs up to when he gets to about 18 kilometers an hour. And from 18 kilometers an hour, you get to what uh, is sometimes called lactate threshold two, sometimes called the anaerobic threshold. And then as you speed up beyond that, it's no longer linear, it, uh, your, the lactate, uh, your sense of intensity just goes up massively, um, almost exponentially. Now, is anybody familiar with the five zone model? All these watches have got it. Yeah. Um, there are critics of the five zone model because they, they say, well, the body doesn't really work in five zones. The body really works in three in relation to this anyway. And, uh, and those three, if we just call them zone one, easy, zone two, moderate, and, and zone three, hard, that gives us a model that we can actually start saying, well, how much intensity are we supposed to be training in each of these zones? The problem with the five zone model is, uh, A, it's a bit complex. Uh, B, it doesn't actually fit in perfectly with the way the uh, body works itself. And C, they become almost interchangeable. Some people put zone two here, some put it here, and you're not really sure which side of the, the threshold that, that they actually mean. But uh, if you are interested in heartbeats and stuff like that, LAT LT1, the aerobic threshold, normally somewhere about 75 to 80% of your max heart rate. LT2, normally somewhere about uh, 87 to 90-ish of your heart rate. And then beyond that, you're spiralling upwards. Is there any, uh, any questions so far? Yeah, is that all make sense so far? Hopefully it does. Yeah. <laughs> right, um, real world, um, this is an athlete. Does anybody recognise that athlete? Me, well. I can't actually see the picture. I've got some glasses. I don't know whether you ever raced it against him. Your powers may never have crossed. Zeus and E. Tedessa. Now, Tedessa was part of the original Breaking 2 project and uh, um, this is actually a, 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 some data produced by a guy called uh, Professor Andrew Jones who was actually the, the physiotherapist on the Breaking 2 project and uh, I was lucky enough to be at the European Endurance Conference in 2021 and he presented some of his findings and, and he used Tedessa as one of his examples. Now Tedessa is, uh, um, I think at one point he may have held the world record for the half marathon. Um, He's got freakily high, um, when I say high this way, he's, uh, he can run easy up to about 19 kilometers an hour before he hits uh, his uh, threshold one. Uh, his threshold two by, um, I suppose by definition, threshold two is, is typically the pace that you can hold for an hour. He can run a half marathon in less than an hour. So it's around about the 21, 21 and a half kilometers an hour is his threshold two zone, and then it spirals upwards. Um, so that, that's Tedessa. Now, there was apparently, there was a Belgian journalist that was also at, uh, sort of covering the Breaking Two project, and this guy, they did a test on him. And uh, so I'm trying to bring this into, I suppose, the real world that needs a little bit more to us mortals, okay? Um, this guy is still a 40 minute, 39 minute 10k runner apparently, so d decent athlete, okay? Um, now he's, uh, the blue line is his, uh, his lactate readings, and you can see it's, it's fairly flat till about 11 kilometers an hour. It's a bit linear-ish till about 14 kilometers an hour, and then it spirals upwards. And he finishes his test at just over 16 kilometers an hour, so 10, 10 miles an hour, and uh, then Tedessa steps on the treadmill and starts running easily. Now, that, that's a 40 minute 10k runner, okay, so he's, he's a reasonable runner, okay? So, so that's, uh, 
that's an idea that uh, these thresholds do work broadly across a range of athletes. Okay, they do make sense. We've all got, it's not quite as clear as the previous slide, but uh, even our, our Belgian journalist has got a flat zone up to about 11 kilometers out, a linear zone up to about 14, and then it spirals upwards. So um, this is my attempt to make sense of that data, okay, and to show that the differences where we've got our three to seven model that I've tried to introduce as to how these are different for these two athletes, but the complete difference in and what it means to runners like us, or you, because I think I'm fading away now, um, in the real world, easy, Tedessa can run easily at about 310 a kilometre. <laughs> Uh, our Belgian journalist probably he needs to be five minutes, you know, eight minute miling or slower before you know he's, he's a 40k, 40 minute, 39 minute, 10k run. He's probably going slower than five minutes per k for it to be easy. He's moderate. Tedessa is in that zone between a fairly small zone in his case, up to this 21 kilometers an hour. So he's moderate. He's, 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 he's what we're into his tempo to threshold type runs. Is in this three or five per k to two speeding up to two fifty four, okay? And his hards <coughs> would be faster than that twenty one kilometers an hour. Our, our journalist, our, our, our you know good average runner, these are somewhat different, but uh, he's our good average runner still has these zones, okay? He's got this uh, got this zone, the moderate zone, which is somewhere between four fifty a k down to four ten a k, so either side of seven minute miling maybe. Um, and then he's got this hard zone where when he's going quicker, a lot quicker than seven minute miling, he's probably in his hard zone. So we design these zones, what do we do with them? Um, have you heard of polarised training? Most people will have. A guy called Stephen Siler or Sailor, I think, had uh, done a lot on polarised training. And his was very much based around, this is the one on the right here, the black block, 70 to 80% of the overall volume of training is actually in zone one, the easy zone. Not much in the moderate zone, and about 20% of the training is in the hard zone. So you're polarizing with 70 to 80% of your endurance training being relatively easy running, and 20% of it being hard. Um, pyramidal is, uh, we're going to delve quite deeply into this, is where you do 70 to 80 of, of your overall volume in zone one. You do more volume in your moderate zone than in your hard zone. So it's no longer polarised between easy and hard. You've got a decent amount of volume going on there in that middle zone. And on the left hand side here, we've got the threshold zone which uh, more than 25% of overall training volume is conducted in that middle zone. Now, I think actually that this threshold zone is where a lot of runners end up until they get into an organised training programme. Um, they, in fact, a lot of them, it, it is more than 25, I think they probably end up in the 40 or 50 in, in, in this sort of threshold model. Reason is, I think, uh, a lot of us are very bad at doing easy running. Um, we, we, you know, we're limited for time. We're going out for half an hour. Let's make it worth it. Next day, let's make it worth it. Now, you know, ne next day again, oh yeah, I've got another half an hour. Let's make it worth it. The result of that a little bit is, yes, you do a decent amount in this threshold zone. You probably could run a reasonable half marathon maybe off it, but you don't, you're too tired very often to do a reasonable amount in this hard zone which is one of the important zones. Because you're permanently tired, you can't get your body up to the intensity levels uh, required by the, uh, in that hard zone. So it's not to say the threshold zone, the threshold model doesn't work, but um, it's just to be aware, I think, that, uh, that we, we get drawn into it, and probably most of us, I think, end up doing a little bit too much hard running and, uh, and that's what one of the takeaways we're hoping to produce today is to give you a bit of a monitor as to what you might do in the way of easy running and, and 
how to approach it. I'm going to go back to it historically a little bit, and uh, I'm going to skim over this really quickly, but uh, there's a bit of a, a cycle that's happened over time between in high intensity training being used. Um, in the 30s to 50s, you had uh, Gertschner and Stanford. Stanford was um, Roger Bannister's coach, and it was most of it was high intensity work, whether it was in the gym, reps, hard short runs, but a little, an awful lot of that was very high intensity work. In the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you had a bit of a swing. You had a guy called von Aachen that, to his theory, was uh, we're training for aerobic endurance here. The best way to get in aerobic endurance is to run aerobically. And his model was <coughs> slow, loads of slow running, few strides, and a few race pace efforts. And uh, um, he got some fairly good results off that. He's a German guy. This guy, uh, Norpoff, who was, uh, I forget whether it was the, I think it was the 64 Olympics. He got the silver medal in the 64 Olympics off the back of uh, uh, that type of training, which is probably almost 95% easy, 5% hard. Um, Lydiard, I don't know how much of you sort of study, but Lydiard, mo an awful lot of modern day programs are Lydiard. And uh, Lydiard's big model was you only peaked for a short period in the summer, did a massive amount of aerobic work during the winter, almost even his 800 metre runners trained like marathon runners. Um, and then they went through a sort of power and speed development phase, then they went through a high, a high intensity phase and they sort of came out um, uh, as a, in Peter Snell's case, as probably one of the best 800 metre runners that uh, history has seen, I think. But uh, um, Snell won the 1960 and the 1964 Olympics. He was the first person, I think, to do repeat, repeat Olympics. I think he might still be the only person to have done repeat 800 metres, I think. I'm not sure on that. Is it? Yeah. He was running about 1 minute 44 back in the, on, the, on the grass and cinder tracks in 1960. So it worked for Peter Snell. Uh, Compatriot Maury Halberg did very well off that. Also, now, Lydiard was again of the belief that if you want to build your aerobic system up, don't challenge it with acidic, acidic type lactate running. Do it easily. Um, and he built up such an aerobic system, he knew it, his hypothesis was, well, you know, you could do the, lact the heavy lactate work after, but um, uh, you, you've got a backdrop of this massive aerobic system to, 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 to play around with there. I suppose you could argue that this sort of stuff continued into the sort of 70s and early 80s era. Runners like Yvette and Elliot and Crown were probably more coming off that type of training programme. Um, I must say, I've got a real. Ovet's well, probably my favourite athlete, but he's difficult to use as a model because I think he probably could have done anything and he probably <laughs> would have been a world class runner. I think he had uh, so much ability. But uh, Cram has probably got the best of it out of himself doing that, that uh, sort of long to short system. There's a bit of a swing with Seb Coe in the 80s and 90s, which went right over to quality. Loads of so we've sort of, we have this high intensity stuff, 30s, 50s, with more balanced loads of aerobic work in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and there was a bit of a swing in the 80s and 90s, whereas Coe's big thing was uh, quality over quantity, you know, if you want to run fast, if you want to run fast, you've got to train fast, all of those sorts of things. He was rumoured to only be in doing 25 miles a week. Um, I think you'll see that that rumour was probably not true on, the net, on one of the slides to come up soon. But following that, and I don't mean to criticise the runners that were around in that time, but both British and US runners who adopted this higher quality type model, it was a little bit of a dearth of runners right at the forefront for about 15, 20 years after Co. There, they, there was a few around, and, 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 but not that, that great number that there was in the, and, and it's a, I suppose, a devil's advocate type uh, question. Did Co's success and his push to low volume, um, very high quality. Did it work for everyone? Worked for him, but did it did it work for everyone? So I'm going to swing to. Um, this is the sort of stuff Co was doing as an 18 year old. 
Um, it's from this book. Nice, well-worn book. <laughs> Those pages <laughs> fall out if you flip it. Um, I think the book was written in the 90s, I think. Uh, so as an 18, as an 18-year-old, Kerr was doing double days. He was doing easy running, though. Um, but when he was running intensely, which I've got, a, if you go Sunday to Saturday, you've got seven days there, and you've got one, two, three, four, five intense sessions in those seven days. I, I think if we went back to our, our um, if I can go back a couple of slides, there's not a slide there that represents what Co was doing really. I think he's off this way somewhere. And he's probably got a black line that goes up to 50% and a white line that goes up to 50%. He's doing something like that. The, um, um, although this is, this is a training programme that's probably 40, 50 years old, I think it was, was he 66 the other day, he said? Yes. Something like that. So, so this is when he was 18. So someone do the maths. Is that 38 years ago? 48 years ago? 48 years ago. 48 years ago. Um, Keely Hodgkinson's program isn't massively different in terms of the type of session she's doing to that. Um, but I don't think she's doing that sort of volume. So although we've gone back in history a little bit here, a lot of this stuff is still fairly relevant sessions and uh, one thing that has changed is that somebody like uh, 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 Keely Hodgkinson, the, the, some of these easy sessions that are put in there she'd be doing on an exercise bike or a cross trainer or something like that and she probably isn't doing the frequency, she's probably not doing four or five sessions a week but she would be, she's what's Keely, 20 now, she's probably double daying on most days and stuff like that. So although that's quite old um, information, it's, uh, it's sort of still relevant, I think. But there's a little bit of swing back after that. Um, you've got a paradox in endurance training. I said before that we're operating using two um, energy systems and they're interacting all the time. To be successful, we need a high lactate response, so we've got to train that lactate. This is a slide taken from a US high school coach called Scott Christensen. But successful distance uh, racing requires a well-developed aerobic energy system. And this explains why we might not want to do too much quality. Now, Single, this is one session. If you take the lactate level up to seven millimoles a litre, which is the sort of lactate you'd get <clears throat> after a hard five or 10k race, typically. Um, you're gonna, now, I don't know whether you're killing them completely, I'll be honest, or whether you're just damaging them and they come back the day later, but you're damaging your mitochondrial numbers. Now, mitochondria are a part of the aerobic energy system. Um, if you've got a good and a, aerobic energy system you've just got loads of mitochondria and their their job is basically to convert chemical energy to to, to muscle movement um, they're, they're part of that process so if you reduce and they work best in general with aerobic um, um, and if they're part of that system really so if you're taking away 30 you know uh, killing three five eight percent of those mitochondria because you've done a really hard training session then the next day you're not going to be capable as quite as much. Now, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't know how quickly uh, your, your system recovers, but it is a, an indicator that uh, if you're doing too much quality, you're damaging, your, you're at risk of damaging your aerobic system. Although, uh, I'm not going to read all this out, but uh, there's a, a, a Veronique Billat, that's around about the year 2000, did a lot of work on VO2 max type training. And uh, she did do a study where she took a, a, a group of runners that were just used to doing six or seven steady runs a week. Um, 
She then subjected them, and she did several studies, similar studies. She then subjected them to one VO2 max session a week. VO2 max is about the pace that if you, you could only maintain for about seven or eight minutes, typically. The six-minute test that uh, is used by some training groups is a sort of a test of VO2 max. So is broadly as the 12-minute test, I suppose. It's a measure of aerobic power. Um, she put one VO2 max session in a week with these runners and got, got an improvement, which is what she was looking to prove. Um, but then she did another four weeks of training where she did three VO2 max sessions a week and uh, saw no improvement. So they were training harder, but they weren't improving. Um, I think... I think that the paper that she did wanted to prove that uh, they could find overtraining in these athletes. I don't think they strictly found overtraining in, the, in these athletes. They didn't find any improvement, um, but uh, it is a small sample, so you could question whether it stands up completely. But they did find markers of overtraining, that the athletes were complaining of being sore, and uh, they also had, uh, uh, um, I forget, it's, it's no adrenaline, I think, that they were testing for, which is one of the markers for overtraining. So they, they, they found that there was an indication there that these athletes on three quality sessions a week at VO2 were actually overtraining. So we're swinging back. Um, if Co was the high intensity lay volume um, version, then um, I don't know if uh, how much you've read up about what Inga Britson's doing and stuff like that, but it's a little bit off the back of, uh, if we call it the Norwegian model, and I think it's best described as low intensity, high volume, uh, and they use lactate measurements to control their training below certain levels. Um, Marius, a guy called Marius Bakken has done quite a lot of work on this, and although he's quite uh, he puts it forward as not being fully scientific, it's just a theory. There's no doubt it's, been, it's a theory that's been taken up and run with, quite literally, or even triathlon with. Um, um, his big thing was the feeling that the mechanical benefit you get from running faster in sessions and doing runs a little too fast than threshold, plus doing too much training at race pace for longer periods of the year, cannot be compared with the increase in performance you'll get from optimising the anaerobic threshold. If we went back to our, um, if I can go all the way back, sorry, I'm going back a mile here. If, uh, I'll even go one further by then. The anaerobic threshold is this LTP, um, the rightmost marker there. What you want to be doing to get better is to move that to the right. What the Inga Britson model is, is if you do a lot of training just below that point, you push it to the right. That means that your threshold pace, the pace that you can maintain for an hour, becomes quicker. Um, the quality version of it is like pulling to the right. And training programs are working really on the basis that you're either pushing it to the right by running below, um, that threshold point where you're pulling it to the right by doing the quality work. Sorry to dash forward again. Now, I've, uh, I am going to hope to make these, uh, this slide thing available because those of you who want to dig deeper into this, um, there's a number of links that are well worth reading actually. That I'm skimming over the surface of some of this stuff. But uh, these, uh, uh, the papers are available, some of the lectures are available that were at the uh, European conference last year. But uh, there's a website there where Mary Spacken explains what he calls the Norwegian model. Now, what the Norwegian model is, is high volumes of very easy running, typically 70 to 80%, even for runners like uh, Inga Britsen, who's a 1,500, 5,000 metre runner. Um, the quality running, now, his big theory really is, is by taking the pace down slightly, you can do loads of moderate running. Um, it doesn't actually do much in the, uh, in the zone three, 
an awful lot of Zone 2 stuff. Um, he does it at threshold pace. They stack their days up. Now, I think a few have tried this locally, actually. Um, I think Will Bodkin was doing this. Uh, although I, I, I don't think he was doing both sessions at threshold. <laughs> he was doing a threshold in the morning and, uh, and a, a hard run in the afternoon. Um, interspersed with easy days, and then they'll do one high quality run a week, one high quality session a week. This is, I'm not really delving much in periodization here, but this is, I think, more out of season type training. But um, typically it'll be done like Monday, two easy runs, one in the morning, one in the, one in the afternoon. Tuesday, threshold morning, threshold session afternoon. Um, the threshold sessions aren't always just one continuous run, <coughs> sometimes they're broken up. Wednesday, recovery day. The theory is, or the theory that they're proposing really is you're going to recover better. And I think, uh, I think Jamie did this today. Where's Jamie? Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> Jamie did this today. He did a hard session yesterday and he went out for an easy run this morning and he went out for an easy run this afternoon. And, and the, the theory is, is that you're going to recover better by just prodding your system, getting it working, getting your blood circulating, getting it delivering nutrients to your muscles and stuff like that getting a little bit of a hit to get the system working, resting, then doing the same thing in the afternoon, and, uh, and then you can come back the day later and you can bang out your, your t two threshold ses sessions again. So that, that's what the, uh, the Norwegian model sort of is based on. And uh, I'll highlight, um, typically, the lactate threshold where the, um, the anaerobic lactate threshold that we're trying to train below is for a lot of runners is four millimoles. This is a guy called uh, Kalat Berglund. Uh, I think he was in the uh, 2019, I don't know whether he made the final, but he was world championship level athlete. And uh, he's following the, uh, the Norwegian model. He happens to be Swedish actually. But, um, um, so he's got Monday, two easy runs, works on a little bit of uh, Technique and speed drills, basically, Monday, Monday evening. Uh, Tuesday, two threshold runs controlled by lactate. He'll control his pace down. One of them, long reps. And I'll, uh, the next slide, I'm going to go into how easy they're doing these reps, or try to describe that it's going to be easy for them. Um, mm -hmm. on, uh, on Wednesday, distance run, um, some strength and conditioning, which Lee will hopefully go into that sort of stuff and other stuff. Um, Thursday, two threshold runs. Friday, relatively easy day, just, just one distance run of 10k, that will be relatively easily done. Saturday is their X session, um, which uh, in his case, and I think we're, we're doing something similar to this tomorrow with our group, uh, we're not going to do 20 by 200 metres, but we, we might do 16. Uh, and that's the only one you can see he's got uh, a lactate reading of 8 millimoles. That's the only one that's at that in more intense level. Um, and on the Sunday, long run and weights in the afternoon. This is something that I think some of our local top runners hopefully can... It's brilliant, this, because it's in Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> but what's great about it is... What do you think upwarming means? <laughs> I looked all these up, it's warm up. <laughs> Near jog, literally, I think it means down jog. <laughs> so, um, this is a guy called Bjornar Christensen. This is a bit earlier in the cycle. I think he might have even been coached by Marius Backen. The reason I think he's quite a good example is that he's got 10 kpb of 29.15. So, our top guys in the island, he's you know, 10 or 15 seconds quicker a K than our top guys in the island. Okay, they, they sort of running 31 minutes for 10K. Um, he's got a 5K PB. Little bit quicker, I suppose, in relative terms, in overall quality terms. It's quite close to yours, Lee, isn't it? Yeah? Uh, his event is probably the 3K steeplechase. 8.16 8, 8, 8, 8, for 3K steeplechase is quite his, his world, world championship level. Um, but... Um, 
Sorry about the Norwegian bit, but I've, I've used this to try and um, illustrate the control that he's putting on his training here. Because uh, Thursday, tools day, I think, to the school, I, I, I understand his threshold. So he's doing a threat, he warms up, warms down, he controls his lactate level to three, he does it at a speed of about 320 per K, which for a runner of that quality isn't that difficult. And, uh, and, and he, d he does a 6K run. Now, we've got local guys that, that, that will be able to do that. Um, they'll do that session. Um, but obviously for a runner of that quality, it's a much easier session. And because it's a much easier session, he can go again in the afternoon. And he can do, sorry, the uh, HDMI thing is blocking it out. It's 12 by, 12 by 1K. Now again, likes of Priestie, Will Bodkin and people like that, if you ask them to do 12 by 1K with a minute rest between, they could hit these paces that this guy's hitting. 305 per K, 306 per K. But what he's doing, he's controlling his pace down. He's, uh, he's running at slower than his 10K pace. It's probably about his half marathon pace. He, he's running to, he's monitoring his heartbeat. A lot of the readings are around the 160. After every third or fourth rep, he takes a lactate reading to measure that he's not training too hard. And uh, at the end of it, um, he's done 12 by 1K. He's done two, a total of threshold running that day of uh, 10 miles worth of threshold running that day. Uh, he does a couple of easy runs, relatively easy runs the next day. And why I wanted to use this is well. his easy run pace is, so he's just done his, his threshold running at nearly three minute a K. Okay? His easy running pace is four and a half minutes per K. Okay? He's, he's, he's dropped 50%. And that's his easy run pace. So if you're doing your hard runs at, uh, I try and use some other figures in. If you're used to doing your hard runs at say uh, at six minutes per k, your easy runs are nine minutes per k. That's the sort of range that he's he's doing. Um, and and this is what I mean. I think we all do this. If you used to, I mean, I do a lot of my, I I, I do my easy runs. Uh, I do my hard runs uh, these days. I'm about four minutes per k. I do my easy runs at about 5, 5.15 per k. It's too quick, really. They're not really easy runs. I'm probably training as a, as a sort of threshold type. Of. Anyway, that's the example of what... Uh, so I've shown you, in, in some respects, uh, the example of K, which is all quality, quality, quality. This is the sort of uh, thing that uh, is a bit of uh, the thing at the moment, I suppose. Um, I called it the Norwegian model. Uh, no Norway's got... Uh, a host of pretty good athletes. I really tried to find an example using uh, Katrine Grovdal, the uh, leading 5,000 metre runner in steeplechase, a female, because it'd be good to put a, a woman's example up there. I couldn't find that. I do know that there's some work going on where um, Christian Blumenfeld, the uh, triathlon gold medalist, is looking to do three threshold sessions a day. One, two of them might be running and one of them might be cycling. But they, they're stacking up the threshold sessions and they take an easy day the next day. Does it matter what events you're training for or would those numbers still... I, I, I think um, it would do. It would do. Because I think uh, what I'm throwing this in, some of these examples in and some of them are used by middle distance mm. athletes almost out of season and we'll see a little bit, there's a hint of it, when they come nearer the season they tend to become a little bit more polarised again. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, there's a, a slide coming up that hopefully will just um, hint at, at that a little bit. Now, I, I think I'm going to have to speed up soon a little bit. I won't dwell too much on this slide because I've got a few examples. I think we'll recall that if you want to go back and, and look at this. It's an idea of Christensen. Um, um, he's using his, his uh, I'm guessing by his uh, paces, uh, his lactate uh, threshold two pace is somewhere in the 305, 310 per K. If you're a 55 minute 10K runner, you're about 530 per K. 
His easy pace, he's going sl as slow as 430 a K on his easy. So he's adding almost 50% onto that. You know, you're, if you're a 55 minute 10K runner, your easy pace might be as slow as seven minutes, something like that per K. And uh, um, although I've been, um, I, I was given the example of Jeffing as an example to run a marathon by somebody that was running, he was a three hour marathon runner. And I couldn't understand why if you were that, uh, to me, you had to, um, if you're looking to break three hours, what's the point of making it harder by walking for, for a bit of it? Because that means you've just got to run really quick when you're running. But, and, and I, 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 I've got to be careful I word this, if just the action of running for the best part of four and a half, five hours is taking you too far up that lactate curve, you might need to intersperse your running with the odd walk, walk to just bring you back down. And uh, it might be that if you're training for a marathon, and uh, you want to get a long run in, you might actually be better doing interspersing a long run with walks because 740, you might be better doing 730 per mile and then walking a KD just to bring your lactate level down again. It's only a, a bit of speculation there, actually. Um, I've gone back to these intensities, and if you plug the numbers, the um, Swedish. Um, 1500 meter runner was probably using the threshold type model. Um, the uh, Christensen, the uh, steeplechaser, was in the pyramidal model, so we haven't really touched this polarized model, model with, with those. I think they both move towards the polarized model when they're in season, or as they approach the season, and uh, um, we'll go a little bit into that later. I can't don't want to delve too much into um, this is something uh, presented at the uh, European conference last year by uh, and it backs up some of this easy running stuff by uh, a guy called Arturo Casado well I think definitely is your e era Lee I think you've raced him yeah well yeah, yeah I, I, he's a runner, wasn't he yeah I think so, so. yeah I, yeah I think he, I, he won an, an in uh, either the European 1500 or the European indoor 1500 yeah. anyway he he did some research, he took, uh, does it say that it was the best part of 100 runners, I think. I think he was trying to apply it to, um, um, you know, this theory of 10,000 hours of, uh, of um, purposeful practice, I think, is that the term? Uh, to, to get skilled at something. I think he was trying to apply it to runners. And he broke the type of running they did and looked for correlations. And... Uh, he broke it into short interval training. These are all long distance runners. He broke it into tempo runs, easy runs. And he looked for correlations to how good they were. He used um, IAAF tables to, to see what quality they were. And he took them after three years, after five years, and after seven years. The uh, biggest correlation that he could find with how good they were were A, the total volume running they did, and B, surprisingly, it wasn't anything to do with the, the what type of short interval training they did, what type of long interval training. The next marker, the biggest correlation he found was how much volume of easy running they did. So it, it, his research more or less showed, don't focus too much on quality, maybe you, looked at, maybe you need to taper it down a little bit. Um, we talked about runners perhaps peaking and moving over to a more uh, polarised model. This is a guy called Stuart McSwain, the Australian guy in the middle there. Um, I, I think uh, he's had illness for the last 18 months or so and hasn't really responded so well, but uh, I think he had a cracking 5,000 metres at the end of this season. And this was leading up to the 2019 um, World Championship final. And they tracked his type of training for the last 52 weeks the last 26 weeks, the last 12 weeks, and the last six weeks leading up to the World Championships in, the, in the 2019. And over 52 weeks, he was showing massive, nearly 90% of his training was in Zone 1. It's a pyramidal model, because he's doing more Zone 2 training than the rightmost bar, um, Zone 3. Halfway through the year, not much difference. Uh, 26 weeks out, he's still doing um, 
a, a pyramidal type training model, but the last six weeks he switches over, he's doing polarised. Um, if you can read it, his total volumes are about 90 miles a week running. Drops a little bit in the last six weeks, but it's, it, it's, uh, that's the sort of volumes that Stuart McSwain is doing. Now, he, he races, uh, I think he's the American, uh, not the American, the Australian record holder, over 1,500, um, 5,000. I don't know whether he broke the 10,000 or not. So that's some real high volume stuff, but do we want to do that for everyone? Um, apologies to anybody that might be in this photo. <laughs> <laughs> I think three of them are here, actually. <laughs> um, um, you've always got this balance to look out, speed versus endurance. Um, I had to. I went to a real panic today because I thought uh, uh, the. Tom's done some excellent work on the, you know, the philosophy behind the, uh, the athlete development model. And I thought, am I going to put something here that completely contradicts it? I think it actually, I hope it actually works within it, actually. Uh, developmental age. You don't want to be buying loads of volume at young athletes. Um, you want to be uh, working a bit more on their speed, potentially. Trainability. You might have an athlete that by their own, I think we've got a couple of these, um, by their own makeup, they are blessed more with more fast twitch lactate using muscle, muscles or, uh, um, I suppose, uh, muscles are able to use the lactate system than they've got slow twitch muscles. They might have to train in such a way that maximises their use of those muscles. Um, no point in bunging loads of miles at people that haven't got the biomechanics right. That's again something that Lee might uh, look at. Um, Certainly when we do our sessions, we try and do quite a lot of drills and stuff like that, and that's stuff to try and get uh, your biomechanics right, or at least uh, keep you focused on it. The other thing, that's consideration for a middle distance athlete, are you a cow? Um, I think one of, the, one of the athletes in this picture is, I think. <laughs> Maybe not quite as good, but I think more that sort of model of athlete, in, in that he's going to respond, I think, more to higher quality uh, there are certain athletes that are going to respond more to the higher quality, low volume stuff, and there are certain athletes, perhaps also in that picture, that might respond more to, to, the, to the higher volume approach. So, a few closing th thoughts, actually. You'll be pleased to know we're near the end. Three zone model can be a useful tool to balance overall training intensities. Um, been through that. The pyramidal or polarised models may be of use within a training cycle and it does seem as though if you're training in the, for events in the region of 1500 to 10k that using pyramidal type training, more threshold work, out of season, bringing towards a more polarised model as you approach the season is probably uh, going to work. Um, overdoing quality may cause stagnation the, the paper by Bill Act. Uh, I think we've all got anecdotal, I mean, I've got anecdotal tales of, uh, you know, I thought, oh yeah, I could, that training session didn't go very well. Uh, you know, must get it right tomorrow. Didn't go well again. Oh, must get it right tomorrow. And it's not until you actually stop and actually reset and say, you know what, I'm gonna run easily for a week and I'll come back, that you actually get yourself back in, out of that stagnation zone. So, overdoing quality might cause standard. International level distance rides can take large volumes of uh, often 75 to 80 percent of their total volume. Is easy, that should say of easy running. Sorry, there, I've edited that. That should say of easy running. Middle distance runners and younger runners may want to consider the quantity versus quality balance. And um, many programs, even the Norwegian model, continue with this hard day, easy day cycle. They make their hard day quite hard by bunging two threshold sessions in it, but they make sure they have an easy day, recovery day, day after. And uh, easy pace used by international runners for them is very easy. So, nearly there, finishing off. A um, couple of slides at the end, uh, just as some references, um, that if you want to dig a bit deeper into some of this stuff, uh, you might want to read them. Um, 
also some videos from the European Endurance uh, Conference. There's uh, both uh, Arturo Casado, you can watch his presentation there, and also the president. Very, I'd recommend if you're interested, is uh, watch the presentation by. Um, The bottom one there, Prescribing Endurance Training from Physiological Tests by Professor Andrew Jones. There's a YouTube uh, a video of that presentation. It's only 45 minutes long. And uh, he's the guy that was behind the Breaking 2 project. He's worked with uh, Paula Radcliffe and he takes a good talk through all of this stuff. It's well worth having a look at that. And I mentioned Paula Radcliffe and I wanted to get some... Uh, and I was aware that all, all the data, everything that I could find in digging this stuff out, was all male athletes. And I thought, we've got to get some female representation here. And uh, this is Paula Radcliffe's training leading up. It's the last two weeks, um, was it three weeks leading up to London Marathon? And uh, I think their heartbeat is, Matt's heartbeat is probably at this time around the 195. <coughs> So she's doing quite a lot of stuff around the 80, 82, 83% um, of her max heart rate in this period. And um, I don't know the exact volume, I didn't add it all up, but it's, it's massive, it's 140 miles a week or 120 miles a week or something like that. And uh, at the end of this, she ran the 215 uh, world record for women. It's recently been broken, but only recently been broken. She's still doing 53% of her running in zone 1, 45% uh, of it in zone 2, so it's a pyramidal model, and, uh, and in zone 3 she's hardly doing any in zone 3. Now, the reason why a track runner might go polarised, as they 